This morning we are beginning a new series. The series is entitled, A Disciple's Deepest Desire. It is actually not a new series, it's an old one from an old prayer, a prayer that I wrote about maybe 15 years ago and have been working on it for a long time and have tried and will continue to try and uh, hoping by the end of this year to have it as a manuscript because this is a goal that I have to write a book on this particular prayer. And I'm going to give it to you one installment at a time. It will take us six or seven messages at least, and then we can, um, we can probably have a manuscript by the end of the year. So the first part of this prayer is basically uh, calling out to God and asking God to help us to enlarge our capacity. And so it is entitled, Enlarge My Capacity to Know You, meaning God, more intimately. Enlarge my capacity to know you more intimately. Experts tell us that human beings only use, at best, 10% of their potential. So I think that if in, in our ability to use the brain that God has given us, we can only use 10% of it because God has given us so much, I'm thinking that in our spiritual lives, maybe we are in the same place where we're probably only using 10% of our really a real ability to connect with God. So that's why that whole sense of enlarging our capacity, asking God, God, I know there's got to be more than I can know about you in such a way that my life can be transformed. I, have, uh, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior when I was probably 13 years old. And from there, I uh, started reading Scripture, and all of my life, Scripture has been just a foundational part of who I am. I never liked to read, but the, when I picked up the Bible, I couldn't put it down. When I went to school, in college, I studied, I studied Bibli biblical studies, and I got a bachelor's in biblical studies. I got a master's in uh, biblical studies, and I have a doctorate in spiritual formation. So that's a whole lot of years of studying this one thing. And one of the things that I found out is that with all of that, I still re realize that I could know God more intimately because there's so much of God to know. So if we lived a hundred lives, we would never get to the place of knowing God completely. So there is room to be able to grow with God and to grow in that sense more intimately. Intimacy implies an established relationship which through time has developed into a deeper, more personal interaction between two people. It is never instantaneous, but it is always progressive. So this sense of when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we, we get to know God. We get this burst of energy. We get very excited. But that's only the beginning. Because now you begin a journey. And this journey never ends. Now, there's some people, when, once they reach that place where they, high, uh, they graduate from high school, they figure they know everything that they, they need to know. And they don't read another book. After they graduate from college, the same thing happens. And sometimes I feel that as Christians, because we have gone to Sunday school for some time in our lives, we figure we know everything there is to know about God. And so we come to church on Sundays, and, you know, it's a great thing, but it's not because we want to know more. It's just because that's the thing to do. We go to church on Sundays. But I want you to know that there is so much more to God than we could possibly imagine. And so, therefore, we need to deliberately begin to pray, God, I want to know you more intimately. The, the whole sense of knowledge, both in, in the Hebrew and the Greek, covers a range of meanings. One is intellectual understanding. Another one is emotional, I mean, uh, personal experiences, things that happen in our lives, and we say, well, that's got to be God. There is an emotional aspect that we can connect with God, 
And there's also in that sense of personal relationship, which actually includes sexual uh, interaction between two people. That's all part of knowing one another. The principal duty of every human being, however, is to know God. In Scripture, in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, for instance, it says this, For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice, and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offering. We were created by God so we can know him. Somewhere along the line, we have stopped knowing God or searching for him. So when we talk about intimacy, I want us to be, by the end of the, the message today, at least begin to have a sense that there is a potential for me, there's a greater capacity for me to know God. When you think about intimacy, I want you to think about transparency. Intimacy equals transparency. God already knows everything about you and me. There's no secrets. Before you can think a thought, God knows it already. So the transparency part here is my willingness to acknowledge all my flaws without fear of consequence. Again, transparency is my willingness to acknowledge God, uh, to acknowledge all of my flaws before God without any fear of consequences. So that way when God shows me all the stuff in me that's not so good, I can actually turn around and say, God, forgive me. I don't know if you've ever been in a relationship where things are not going so well. You know something that uh, somebody has said to you or done to, uh, to you that is hurtful. So both of you know there's something strange going on, but you can't quite connect what it is until somebody says, you know what, I want to ask you to forgive me for what I said or what I did. As soon as you say forgive me, all of a sudden it opens up this whole new dynamic where there's freedom in the relationship. So when we come to this place here of, of trying to be open before God, it is for us to be able to unburden ourselves of all the things that we have done. Several years ago, when I took my, my first sabbatical, I took two weeks. And for those two weeks, all I did is ask God to search my heart and to allow me to see all the flaws, all the mess, all the garbage that resided in me. It's a scary thing to do. And sometimes most people don't want to go deep down because it is messed up. But God wants us, God already knows that. He just wants us to be aware of that. So once we're aware of that, we can say, God, forgive me for those things. So God is willing to have this intimate relationship with us because he created us for that. The question is, are you willing to get to that place where you can be transparent before God? Are you willing to be able to allow God to reveal to you all the stuff that's in there so that you can come and actually confess before him? As a definition, it's a sort of working definition, uh, what does it mean to know someone more intimately? Somebody put it very simply, and I, I, I love that whole sense. It says, intimacy equals into me see. Into me see. That whole sense of just allowing someone to see what's on the inside of you. And the only way someone can see, you, see what's on the inside of you is if you open up to that person. If you don't open up, they will never know. So intimacy is something that is sort of an, 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 a knowledge that is an inside-out knowledge. Whether it's between a husband and wife or between uh, friends, that whole sense, can you allow somebody inside of you to know everything about you? And this is where God comes in because God really wants that. He already knows everything that's going on in your life. You can't hide a thought from him, never mind an action. But are you willing? Are you willing to be that vulnerable before God and ask God to help you deal with whatever is there? Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24 says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me to the everlasting way. It has to be 
deliberate on our part to come before God and say, God, search my heart. Because we all have sinned. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, not even one. So can we get to that place where we can be vulnerable enough, courageous enough to say to God, God, search me, know me, reveal to me whatever is inside of me that's not right. So that way, once you realize that, you can say, God, forgive me. Because as soon as you say, God, forgive me, there's a release. Have you ever kept a secret where you're afraid somebody's going to find out something about you? It's a heavy burden to carry. But once you acknowledge it and ask God to forgive you, then it's behind you. You don't have to carry that burden anymore. Second point, do you know God or have you only learned certain facts about God? Do you know God or have you only learned certain facts about God? I'm going to go through several uh, aspects of this, uh, beginning with the, the story of the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler came before Jesus and he wanted to figure out, you know, how do I get to heaven? Uh, he was pretty prideful, I think. He knew uh, pretty much that he was doing pretty well, so he wanted to get sort of pat on the back, but things didn't work out that way. Luke 18, chapter, uh, chapter 18, verse 18 through 24 it says, a ruler questioned Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And then he goes on to say, You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And the young man said, All these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell everything you have and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasures in heaven, and come and follow me. And what ensued after that is the fact that the, man, the young man was so rich that he wouldn't do that. And so therefore, he was saddened because he was not willing to give up all that he had. Now, as I was thinking about this particular uh, story, I, I thought about some of the game shows that we, we sometimes see, where you go to the game show and um, uh, the, the host says, well, you just won $5,000. And you can keep this $5,000, or you can choose what's behind door number one, or door number two, or door number three. Right? So you got $5,000 in your hand. That's a guarantee. You don't know what's behind door number one, two, or three. What do you do? See, when it comes to God, door number one, two, and three have a lot more than what you have in your hands. And so often we sort of grab what we have and we don't let go because we're afraid that God does not have any more for us. And this, this young man, could have had so much more if he, if he were willing to follow Christ, whatever the cost. If he had sold everything that he had, he would have had so much more. But yet he decided to hold on to what he had, which when he dies will stay here, then follow Christ, that when he died, he would be in heaven with him for all eternity. We have the Pharisees uh, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 7 and following. Now, the Pharisees, you know, have gotten a bad rap because, uh, you know, people talk about the Pharisees as people, these people that are bad and just try to kill Jesus and so on. But fundamentally, the Pharisees were the most spiritual people. They really were the purists. They wanted to obey all the laws. They did it out of pride and arrogance sometimes, but really deep down they wanted to keep the purity of the, of the commandments of God. So in Matthew chapter 15, verse 7 and following, Jesus says to them, You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. 
So the Pharisees that knew the law still were not applying it in such a way that they had a relationship with God. Number three, you have the false prophets in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and following. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and perform miracles in your name? And then Jesus says, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Now these again are people that are using the name of God to do these things, to prophesy, to cast out demons and perform any miracles. And some people will say, well, that, you know, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. And I want to tell you, I can come here, be as messed up as possible, as far away from God as possible, and preach the gospel to you, and the gospel will reach you because the Spirit of God will reach you because the Word of God is powerful. The name of Christ is powerful. It's not about me or anybody else. That's why these false prophets would think, you know, I did all these things. And Jesus says, I never knew you. We need to get to the place that it's not just what's happening around us. It's about what's your relationship with God. We go to the disciples. From the rich young ruler to the uh, Pharisees to the false prophets, the disciples. These disciples now, the people that are hanging out with Jesus 24-7. In John chapter 14, verse 1 and following says, Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you, so that where I am, there you may be also. And verse 4 says, And you know the way where I'm going. And Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And I bring that point because even those who were hanging out with Jesus all that time didn't understand what Jesus has been talking about. It was not until the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon them that they began to understand what Jesus was talking about. And so my point is this. We often come to church, and we come to church sometimes very faithfully. And sometimes we, we know the stories. We can figure out which book the stories are in. We may know chapter and verse. But the question is still, do you know God personally? Do you know God intimately? Because all these people seem to have known God somehow, somewhat, but still not enough. And so I think we are in a place where we need to begin to make that decision or begin to process at least. How well do I know God? Do I know God intimately? Because that's what God is looking for. God created us for a relationship with him. And that relationship was not a haphazard relationship. It was not, you know, once in a while, uh, get a phone call or a text or something like that. Uh, it's about just a daily sense of connecting with God. And most of us are not connecting with God on a daily basis. So what does it mean to know God? To know God is to recognize him in our midst. To know God is to be so connected with him that when something is happening, you can say, that's of God. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 53 and following, it says this, when Jesus had finished the these parables, he departed from there. He came to his hometown and began teaching them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did, did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? And then they started, is that not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother Mary? And his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And listen to the next verse, verse 57. And they took offense 
at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Now, again, here is Jesus in the midst of people, and they did not recognize who he was. They took offense at him because he's the common man. He's the carpenter's son. He's Mary's son. He's, his brothers and sisters are around. Who does he think he is? Well, they, they, they really got caught up with all his power and his words of wisdom, but they took offense because they didn't recognize Jesus in their midst. And sometimes things are happening all around us, and we don't recognize Jesus in our midst. But if we are connected, if we have developed that intimacy with him, it doesn't matter where we are, it doesn't matter what's happening, we have a sense God is working in this situation. And you are fully aware of that. And that becomes really important because we live in a world that, that's very troubled. And it's important to see and connect with God in those situations and, and recognize that God is in your midst. In Matthew 16, verse 13 and following, it says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they said, Well, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Everybody else is confused about me, but who do you say? You've been hanging out with me for a long time. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It is only God that can help us have that connection, help us realize Jesus in the midst or God in the midst. But that's only when we are connected with him. And this is where the encouragement comes in here as we continue to, to, to go, go through this series. God, enlarge my capacity in this point here to know you more intimately. In John chapter 1, verse 11, uh, it says, Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive him. But John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming in verse 29 of the same chapter, it says, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist was connected. He saw Jesus, he recognized Jesus. So many other people, all the Jewish people have been expecting a Messiah. They saw him, but they took offense at him. Can we figure out when Jesus is in our midst? Well, you see, to know God is a privilege. To know God is a privilege. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 10 and 11, it says this, And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answered them, it says, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. Why do you speak to them in parables? Because Jesus is talking to them in parables, so they don't understand. They're hearing all these things, but they can't figure it out. But the disciples have the privilege to be with Jesus, and Jesus says, to you, it has been granted. Again, because that was the close community of Jesus and his disciples. Now we are his disciples as well, his children. And it is a privilege for us to be able to figure out when God is in our midst. And the only way that's going to continue to happen, you know, sometimes we, we sort of get very excited that we experienced God, oh, five, five years ago when that, that thing happened, I knew that was God. But since five years ago, nothing has happened in your life? Are you still, do you still have to go way back to figure out when God was in the midst? Or is God doing something right now, today, in your life? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if, we, if we're not experiencing him, then something is missing. We're not connected with him. 
And this is why it's so important to pray again. God, enlarge my capacity to know you, not intellectually alone, but to know you more intimately. It has to come down to the heart. It is a privilege to know God. Thirdly, to know God is to fear God. To know God is to fear God. Matthew 10, 28 has some very strong language. It says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Those are strong words from God. See, we have come to a place where we're not afraid of God anymore. We think that God is our buddy. And I want you to know, God is God. He is the creator. He is the savior. Yes, he is our friend. But he's also our judge. And we need to have a healthy fear of God, reverence for God, that we will do what he's asking us to do. We are missing so much of God because God has become just a friend. Someone that we're too cozy with, that even if we messed up on purpose, uh, he, that's okay, he, he won't mind. He knows me, he knows my problem, he knows my situation. No, God knows your situation, he wants to fix it. But sometimes we don't have that healthy fear of God. Proverbs 9, 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. To know God is also a great responsibility. In John chapter 3, actually, I'll just go to John 15. John 15, verse 22. Again, strong words. He said to the people, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. If I had not come, and spoken to them, they would have not, not sinned. But now they are without excuse. That means all of us that have heard the gospel, we are without excuse. We can't say to God, oh, I just didn't know. I've taken that excuse away from you. <laughs> and from me. But the fact of the matter is, we need to get that sense of uh, fear and responsibility that God has spoken. We have heard him. We can't say, I didn't know. So that way we need to really begin to reevaluate our lives. Because to know God is also to have great access to God. And that's a powerful thing. To know God is to have access to him. Jeremiah 29, 13, and 14 says, You will seek me and find me. When you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. God says, if you really seek me with all your heart, genuinely, you will find me. I will allow myself to be found by you, is what he's saying. And you know, there's no, no greater power as you wake up every morning to know that God is with you, that you have access to him. To recognize that if God be for us, who can be against us? So it doesn't matter what anybody's plotting against you. You're not afraid because you know one thing. God is with you. You have access to God. You, you have access to prayer. You got access to God to find peace and joy in the midst of trying circumstances. To know God is to have great access to God. That's powerful. Luke chapter 11, verse 9 through 10 says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone who asks and uh, receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. That's pretty powerful. That's the access that we have with God. See, that access becomes limited when our relationship with him is not strong. 
when we have put them aside for whatever reason. Because when you're connected with God, it doesn't matter what happens in your life, you have this confidence that if I come to God, he will hear me. Jeremiah 33.3, right? He will answer me. He will show me great mighty things which I have not yet seen. That's the power of knowing God. To know God, hopefully, as we conclude, to know God is to want to be more intimate with him. To know God is to want to be more intimate with him. We need to get to that place where we recognize that it is, it is important to know God. And the more I know him, the more intimate I want to be with him. Again, we go back to our text in John chapter 4, verse 10. This is the story of the Samaritan woman who comes to the well to get, to get, to get some water. And basically, she's coming around noontime. You know why she's coming around noontime? Because early in the morning, uh, all these women that come, they're the, they're the women that are married and are living right. And this Samaritan woman is not living right. She's embarrassed of her, her life. She doesn't want to be ridiculed by the other women. So she waits until they're all gone so she can come. And when she comes, Jesus says, can you give me some water? And the woman looks at him and says, you know, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. You're a man. I'm a woman. Why do you ask me for water? What does Jesus say? Verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you knew the gift of God, if you knew who was asking you for this water, you would turn around and say, Give me your water. I'm wondering, do you know God? Do you know who's coming after you? Do you know who's trying to embrace you? Do you know who's trying to have a relationship with you? Do you know who wants to lavish his love on you? Because that's what he wants to do. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me some water, you would turn around and say, give me your water because you will never thirst again. Some of us are still thirsting for the things of the world. We're thinking that we need to have all these things because what we have with God is not enough. And it only doesn't seem like enough because we don't have an intimate relationship with him. And so I want to encourage you to begin to think about this prayer. God... Enlarge my capacity to know you more intimately. I'm going to give you these points one by one. The prayer is going to have about six of these and a conclusion to it. But this week, I want you to genuinely come before God with this one petition. God, enlarge my capacity to know you more intimately. And let him minister to you. Forget about all these other things going on in your life. God already knows everything that's happening in your life. Just come to God and say, God, I'm missing something. Enlarge my capacity to know you more intimately. I have three action points in your outline in the bulletin. Number one is pray that prayer all week long. Number two, be open and honest with yourself daily, meaning Pray that prayer, search my heart, know my thoughts. And as God reveals stuff to you, just say, God, forgive me. Just say, God, forgive me. Be honest with yourself. Don't carry the burden of your sins. Because you may hide it from everybody else, but you know about it. And that's going to get heavier and heavier. And number three, involve your emotions in your relationship with God. Involve your emotions in your relationship with God. Let it not be just head knowledge, but allow God to just come in and just take over. Allow him to fill your heart and your emotion. 
that there'll be a connection, a deep connection, that you will know God the way he wants you to know him. And there's nothing more powerful in the world than having that sense of intimacy with God. I want you again to think about intimacy as being transparent with God. Acknowledge your stuff, your messes, your sins. Acknowledge them. Be transparent with God. Say, God, I know I messed up over here. Forgive me. Think about intimacy again as into me see. Open up yourself so everything is open to God. Even though he knows everything, you need to allow him. You need to be willing to say, God, I know you know all this stuff, but here it is. Be vulnerable enough to trust that God is going to help you deal with those things. God is not going to judge you because of those things if you're willing to acknowledge them. God will judge you in the end because it is a point that man wants to die, but after this comes the judgment. But as long as we're living, God is not here to judge us. God is here to forgive us. If we would only open, open up to him. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads just for a moment. Close your eyes. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this message. If the Spirit of God has moved you to the place where you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, we want to encourage you to say this brief prayer. Simply just say, Dear God, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for my sins. I recognize that I am a sinner in need of forgiveness and salvation. So I pray, forgive me my sins, cleanse me, make me a child of God, and help me from this day forward to live a life that will be pleasing in your sight. If you have said this prayer, we invite you to email us at welcome at mhcbcimpact.org, or you can call us at the office 401-454-0052. Again, thank you for being with us. God bless you. Thank you for listening to today's sermon. This has been a production of Mount Hope Community Baptist Church located in Providence, Rhode Island. Learn more by visiting our website, mhcbcimpact.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, mhcbcimpact.